thank you for having me today. I, when I came, I felt a little bit like an outsider here. I'm a property casualty actuary. I work at a life insurance company. I'm speaking at a pension event. <laughs> I'm a research actuary, and, and at my company, I study emerging topics. And the commonality is financial responsibility. So when I came and I was asked to speak, I was asked to write a paper, I knew that I was going to talk about this key component that I think is impactful to the insurance industry, but it also impacts the retirement industry as well. So I knew what the common thread was, but I wasn't entirely sure that this audience would understand the common thread, that it might be a little bit challenging to draw the, the relationship there. But then as I sat and I listened to the previous presentations, it felt like they were queuing me up it started at the end of this morning and then continued on through lunch. I'll have my own spin on it, but there's some common features. There are certainly several converging trends that have an impact on financial responsibility. The baby boomer generation, the largest generation, is now beginning to retire. And at the same time, the most educated generation, the millennials, are now the largest component of our workforce. These two generations have a common feature, which is that they both were heavily impacted by the financial crisis. Additionally, technology has changed the way we buy and sell goods. We research and purchase goods online, and that has shifted our frame of trust. We used to trust an expert to give us advice, but now we more frequently rely on benchmarking consumers like me and what do they need, as well as um, understand, using reviews to see what we think of a certain product. The workforce has also changed. A third of the population is employed by the gig economy, and so that's changed how people get their benefits. This changes people's needs, and it also creates an opportunity for companies to provide solutions for these changing needs in the fintech space. There's been $16.6 .6 billion invested in over 1,000 companies in financial services in fintech in 2017. My area of focus is on insurance, but insurance is at its heart, a financially responsible tool. And there's also the common feature of financial responsibility with retirement. Financial responsibility is a challenge. 70% of all households would struggle to meet their everyday purchasing or their everyday financial expenses if the primary household wage earner were to die. Half of all households know that they need more insurance coverage, and that relates to a 12 trillion dollar coverage gap. The difference between what they need and what they have is great. So I spent a lot of time on my research trying to understand why. Why do these people not have the coverage when they know that they need it? So we ask consumers, we try and figure out what is the cause of this difference? Well, insurance has a very antiquated sales process. It takes several weeks to assess a an applicant's risk and then arrive at the decision of whether or not we want to offer a policy to them. Our products are complicated. And that complication has the, the end result is that consumers lack trust in, in our products. It's often said that life insurance is, the cost of life insurance is overestimated. The consumers don't understand what the true cost is. But even if they did understand that it was less expensive than they thought, they would still struggle to make it a part of their, their already tight budgets. And lastly, we are selling an intangible product. Consumers are wanting to have something that provides value to them now. And it's especially troubling when you're trying to sell an intangible product that only provides a benefit if and when you die. So I'm here, to talk about, I'm here to talk about financial responsibility and give a couple examples from the life insurance space. 
My paper talked about four case studies and how we were using these um, examples to address these customer concerns. There's certainly opportunities in InsureTech. InsureTech is a component of FinTech. InsureTech, like FinTech, is also growing. There was $8 billion invested in InsureTech since 2012. My case studies focus on how we can use data to improve the sales process, make it less antiquated. How financial tools can help explain complicated products to consumers. How we can use technology to help consumers better save and use insurance wellness programs to bring value to consumers in addition to financial protection. Data can be used to improve the sales process. So a little overview of what the current process is for life insurance, because this is not a life insurance crowd. Life insurance underwriting is complicated, and I'm not going to walk you through this flow chart. But the gist of it is, is that we, we give consumers a lengthy application. They fill it out. We then give them a medical exam. And then we take their blood. And then several weeks later, we arrive at a decision about whether or not we're going to offer a policy. The industry is trying to improve that that process for a segment, of cons and a segment of consumers, and they're able to do that by taking the data from an application and marrying that with external data sources, identifying a portion of those applicants that have lower risk, and streamlining the process for those consumers. The ones that don't, re that, that have a red flag, as referenced by the X, they'd go through the regular process that they would have gone through anyway. So the end result of being able to use extra data is to streamline the process for a certain segment of consumers. Now, I am an actuary, and so I do like numbers, and talking, giving a thought leadership piece is a little bit like giving a talk without a safety net, so I had to use a few charts. I have just two key messages from this. These are two data sources that are commonly used to augment an application and, and help us um, an accelerated underwriting program. The first is motor vehicle records. Two-thirds of insurers use motor vehicle records to um, come up with a better accelerated underwriting decision. Credit is being used more and more. Currently, 20% of insurers use credit to um, augment their accelerated underwriting program, but an additional 40% are considering implementing credit as a source of data to arrive at a decision. And the reason these data sources are being used is because they're both re related to mortality. We found that people with multiple major driving violations have increased mortality risk. <coughs> Likewise, if we, we have a credit model, the top 5% of people in our credit model have five times better mortality experience than people who have the who are in the bottom five percent. End of life planning tools can help consumers navigate complicated products. The complicated products are often very overwhelming to consumers. Allianz had a survey where they asked consumers about financial needs. And the respondents said that 61% feared outliving their assets more than they feared death. There is a tremendous cost emotionally to consumers by not planning for their end of life. But there's also a financial cost. There are a lot of unclaimed assets that family members don't know about. $58 billion worth of assets go unclaimed because the family doesn't even know about them. That includes life insurance, that includes savings accounts, it includes pension benefits. Tools can help consumers research products to become more comfortable with it and more educated. But as we've talked about before, these tools aren't sufficient on their own. Most of the time you need to use that in conjunction with interpersonal skills. So people can take these tools, become educated, more comfortable with the products, and then go use them to have a conversation with their financial advisor to facilitate the conversation with their family members on this topic that is often hard to discuss. 
And increasingly, we live in a digital world and we have a lot of digital assets that we aren't even aware that we need to communicate unless we have a place that stores them and brings it to the attention that it is actually something that should be communicated. All of this relates to a democratization in services. A lot of these services in the past were only available to people that had means, who were wealthy, but now people who have less means can now afford this type of services on their own. At the heart of financial responsibility is also savings challenges. People who struggle to save struggle to retire, and they also struggle to purchase life insurance. Most people in the United States don't have savings. And oftentimes they will use their savings, or if they have debt, they will use that debt to pay, they will use their retirement savings to pay these expenses. So financial solutions that can help consumers understand costs, who can visualize the future, can help them save. I'm, I was struck by our, a lunch comment about an app that helps you visualize your own image in the future, and I personally found that horrifying. <laughs> Did you try it? No. <laughs> and so I will, there are other apps that help visualize the future, and, and we can discuss that later on. Um, I have some viewpoints about how consumers will respond to that messaging. Um, there were also earlier discussions about a concept that I think of as found money. People, ways to help people make progress toward a goal that seems insurmountable can have tremendous impact. The tools that can help people do this on their own that are self-service also are powerful because people like to have the control to make a little bit of progress on their own. A commonality between life insurance and retirement is that key events are very impactful to our industries. When you get married, when you buy a home, when you have children, these are all times that you have competing financial priorities. But you also have changing needs for your retirement and you have an increased need for life insurance purchases. There's $3 trillion worth of non-mortgage debt that consumers are faced. And in large part, it's because they can't handle these expenses that are related to these key life events. These are times when we could be talking to consumers about being financially responsible, but they have competing priorities and they don't lack, or they completely lack time. Wellness programs, I believe, have tremendous potential in the life insurance industry to provide value for an intangible product and to also create or to help engage customers in a positive way. Wearable technology is often used as part of a component of a wellness program. In the future, the data that was collected from wearable devices could be used as an evidence source to augment an accelerated underwriting program. Wellness programs that can help people age better provide value to consumers, but they also provide value to life insurance companies' um, profits. And additionally, wellness programs that are geared to improving the health of people battling chronic diseases can expand their insurability and allow access to financial products for people that might not have been able to, to get a policy otherwise. There are many large problems facing the insurance industry. There's $12 trillion worth of coverage gap. There's $58 billion worth of unclaimed assets. $3 trillion worth of non-mortgage debt. And 70% of our population is obese, or overweight or obese. This has the potential to provide a great opportunity for insurers who can address these needs and encourage financial responsibility.